youth um, with Greta Thunberg and climate change. I think that'll mainly form, mainly be as a form of connection and then most of the physical stuff will be more localized if when we can get out again. Yeah, I think what Jazz is saying um, is uh, is actually so important. Like uh, the virtual nature of activism serves as a form as so serves as a form as galvanizing people together and spreading information. And then that intertwines beautifully with physical activism, which then mm -hmm. goes to show the um, the extent to which people are upset because it's very confronting to see physical activism. We saw with um, Black Lives Matter movements and school strikes, we see that how it's organized and created and promoted by social media and then carried through with physical activism. So we see that this, they're inherently mixed together nowadays. And I don't think that um, either would be entirely complete without the other going into the future. I'd like to add on with what Tommy said about um, the international like through media, it's like about sharing knowledge, sharing voices, you know, um, face to face, um, protests and, um, like marches is very protest and demonstrate our views and we get face to face with the issue and show people how strong we are. So it's a bit, it's a bit different, but very importantly. Lily, can, uh, I'm getting a little bit of scratchiness through your mic. Um, can you just check that it's plugged in or using a highly technical approach that I often do, give it a shake and just see if that helps with the, the sound. It might just be my mic picking it up. Cause you, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I'm using a Chromebook, so that might be it. I'll go through the settings, see if that helps. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can still hear you, but yeah, it'd be great to capture it really clearly. Yes, did you want to make a comment? Um, yeah, so I think um, even with Lily at the moment, it brings up a really good point of accessibility also, especially in this online time. So, and during the pandemic. So when um, I personally went into isolation with my school, because I am just outside of the ACT border, I found it very difficult to find access to reliable Wi-Fi, which became very difficult when all of your schooling is online. And um, my older sister, sister also is um, completing her uni degree online at the moment, which is all throughout, all through um, Zoom meetings and webinars. And um, she really can't do a lot of physical sort of um, practicals, which is needed for her degree. So I think it really um, shows that accessibility to technology that is reliable and easy to use as well is very important going forward for young people and in a quality of education. Yeah, I, I think we traditionally have seen things like water supply, electricity, probably roads as essential services and infrastructure. And it's probably time that we also see connectivity as essential infrastructure and an essential service that everyone should have an entitlement to because it is just so important um, to every aspect of our lives. You know, I think particularly for young people, but right across the population. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. So I just wanted to say, really... sorry. No, 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 go ahead. <laughs> Jazz brought up a good thing about like accessibility um, and being able to reach, you know, what we need. That can also be said with um, being able to connect with a lot of like people in power. And I think social media that has been, you know, over times has really helped us connect with ministers and people in power and I've seen it you know, when people where um, police forces and those in charge have set up forums where everyday people in the have been able to reach them and you know they're often very busy um, schedules. 
So I think that's a really like important way for way to reach and connect with a lot of different people. Do you think it, it seems from um, at least some of the experiences that you're describing, the, the youth council, the youth advisory council is so important because it does create that space and it ensures that people listen to you. And so that kind of representation and advocacy is just so important. How do you find the situation when you're not a uh, a formal member of the, the council or not um, in a particular forum as a, as a representative of the council. Do you find that the way adults listen to you changes or is it not that stark <laughs> between, you know, your role on the council and, and your, your everyday life? I don't think that you can um, say that the Youth Advisory Council is the only way or should be the only way that youth are heard. Um, in fact, uh, we had a consultation where um, they asked the Youth Advisory Council to listen to their ideas and then signed off on saying that they had listened to us without actually properly listening to us by just consulting to us. And I think that that shows perhaps um, a symbol of just marking us off as a demographic, but rather than not actually listening, we're heard, but not perhaps listened to. And that's the difference that perhaps we get by being able to be on a youth advisory council, but that's an issue that needs to be changed. Off council, I still want to be heard um, as well as I am as a council member. And I think that uh, the disparity between those two should be lessened in, um, mm -hmm. because a lot more people than just me have very important um, opinions that should be heard. Tommy, when and I'm doing I... talking, I think about a comment that a colleague of mine used to make, which was people listening to young people and children's voices with adult ears. <laughs> so the kind of voices are there, but the listening's not happening. And Jazz, that was a very bad moment to cut you off. To kind of make oh, that no. <laughs> Please. No worries. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that um, to add to Tommy, that's very much true. It depends. It, every encounter is different. So one consultation, we will be listened to and respected much like any other member of the community or of government. Um, and the next consultation, it really is like a tick box. And I think that's one thing that in my time on being in the council, I've seen improve over the years as we do get more experience or I get more experience with consultations and we just make sure that they are listening and make sure that we can follow up on what is being done with our voices and making sure that we're more than just a tick box or a comment in the back of the report. Mm. Mm. Um, uh, Sharon, you did mention about like our, uh, how we're heard when we're not in the YAC roles that we've been you know, occupying in, you know, forum spaces. That is all I think, in terms of, you know, the adults and the, you know, places that we have been, that have been open to us, like depending on our schools and who, who in an administration is really open and looking for those opportunities to, um, and listen to young voices. And also how we've been, um, heard by you know the adults in our everyday lives of teachers i think it's very based on very it's very you know personal and how um how we reach out we will listen to our voice and how people reach out to us is there any advice that any of you would give i guess adults generally but particularly adults who are kind of in positions of power and at least state that they want to engage with young people, that they want to consult with young people. What advice would you give them about how to do that well and meaningfully? I would personally say um, to a person, an adult, any adult, any person of power, is just to make every interaction matter. Take every interaction Think about it, take it to heart, because these are people's personal lives and personal stories, and all of them matter. So I think every single person's story 
offers valuable insight into the lives, daily lives of Canberrans. And any of those stories can add, can add to whatever program or new project that you're working on. I might even challenge um, adults to blur the line between adulthood and childhood in terms of it's a simple matter of just like listening to them just as you would any other person and respecting their opinion and understanding their voice just as you would any other one. And I think that just that form of talking in a way that's um, like understanding is yeah. just such a, a small step, but one that can make such a big difference. I think they're such great points. You know, Jasmine, I was listening to those beautiful comments that you made. I was thinking that kind of respect is what we should accord to all human beings around us, regardless of age. And Tommy, you <laughs> summed that up beautifully by saying, you know, let's blur those lines and not have those sort of stark, strict and rigid categories that we often um, impose on people. So can I... Um, ask you perhaps from those issues we've already started to cover this a bit but what do you think are the most important issues that are facing young people in the ACT today and perhaps more broadly about across Australia but particularly here in our local community um, Sophie would you like to kick off on that what do you think are those really important issues well, as we kind of like mentioned earlier, like environment and sustainability of our environment is such an important uh, issue for us because as like the youngest generation, it like impacts our future the most. So I think that's both an important issue in the ACT as well as in Australia. And also like you can definitely notice with the pandemic, the health and well-being and covering both like physical health and mental health of our communities is like really important. But I think that uh, like health and well-being is not only for young people, but for everyone in like the ACT in Australia. And I guess like, because our community and our, our generation is really diverse, um, ensuring there's like equity between everyone um, for like um, all sorts of things and have um, lesser, actually just like get rid of all discrimination is such an important thing that I think a lot of people like our age uh, feel, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's so important and in the kind of the context of thinking about Black Lives Matter and those campaigns, it's really focused our attention um, on mm -hmm. issues of justice and equality and discrimination. Tommy, did you want to add to that? Um, well, I would comment that there's many different facets of discrimination that uh, need to be addressed. So not only just culturally, um, but for example, in youth homelessness, um, such as in different treatment of socioeconomic backgrounds. This isn't just limited to the ACT and not only to youth, but they are matters that affect the ACT and that affect you that you wouldn't normally be exposed to in your day to day life, but issues that still need to be addressed nonetheless. Um, and yeah, I think that discrimination in this way has many different forms that um, are very difficult to summarize in um, a few short sentences. Mm -hmm. And um, to add on to what Tommy was saying, I think another form of discrimination is also disability. And I think, um, and that comes back to what I was saying before about accessibility and making sure that we are an inclusive society. And I think there's a lot of intersectionality between things like um, diversity, discrimination, um, and youth that it can quite often um, that people are put in either either. But it's really important to see youth as a whole and youth as a collective of everything that we are rather than just youth or um, just diverse or just disabled. We need to look at everything that we are and accept it as a whole. Mm. And I think those points speak to the, the importance of the kind of broad-based consultation and listening that you're talking about, because we all do experience our own lives and you know, the lives of the people that are closest to us. But we, we really can't know what's happening in the lives of other people unless we do listen and ask and really meaningfully engage 
So I think there, mm. there's such important points that, that you're making. Lily, did you want to add anything on either on this issue around discrimination or more broadly around the issues that are facing young people in the ACT? Um, I just wanted to like full heartedly agree with Jazz's comment about intersectionality and how important it is. And she touched on like the disabled community and how even within the disabled community with how much, you know, ableism that they face in, you know, simple acts of, you know, the workforce. And then they again face, you know, um, disabled people or people with disability who are also people of colour, you know, um, members of the LGBT who happen to be disabled. It's very, like, groups that have been, you know, marginalised on all fronts, especially need to be heard and, you know, especially young people a lot and um, young, you know, people of the LGBT community, I think especially you know, connecting with the Black Lives Matter movement um, in Australia, that they are, you know, subject to, you know, being targeted in schools and by people in authority, such as, you know, um, like being profiled as suspects. And that happens a lot for young people, I believe, that they are you know, carrying on with their lives, but because they happen to be, you know, an Indigenous Australian, that they are, you know, attacked or they are, you know, profiled or this, you know, suspicion is placed upon them when it is not deserved. Jess, did you want to add to that? Um, yeah, so I just wanted to add a point on um, something that I believe sort of ties all these things together and, um, yeah, is a part of all the different issues in the ACT. And I think for me that is mental health. Um, because a lot of the reasons why these issues are important in young people in the ACT is because of the impact that it has on the individual, both going forward and in the present time. And I think in the ACT, we do have a lot of gaps in, our, in how we deal with mental health, health and um, the help that we provide. Um, so I have a few friends who try and get um, psychiatric help and um, have contacted Headspace and things like that. And in the ACT, um, I believe they give out three um, sessions with Headspace for each person. And after that, there's very little support um, or it is given finance, so you have to um, pay for them. And the cost for each session is very, very high and also varies depending on the individual um, providing the help um, or the psychiatrist. So um, if that psychiatrist has to leave or um, goes away to a different um, company, then that person not only loses that support, but they may also go on to another person who charges a much higher rate and only 10 of these sessions are rebated by the government or Medicare, I believe, or through Medicare, um, which if you think about it, there are 52 weeks in a year. So if that person really does have such severe mental health issues that they need to go and seek outside help, then seeing them less than once a month isn't going to help them in the way that they need. And um, especially if they're in this vulnerable state, it can be very difficult to find work and to keep a consistent job, which just adds to not only economic stress, but then also the stress of going out and um, seeking help even more. Um, and I think there are lots of holes here in the ACT that we really need to work on to make sure that issues within youth are, um, are not only being um, helped or like, um, I guess, growing themselves, but then also the impact of those issues is being aided by the government and by other um, supports. So, yeah, I think whilst greater issues are so important, I think it's also very important to look after our individual youths because the rates are just getting higher, especially with the pandemic this year. 
Jess, what about um, supports in school? I mean, not all young people are in school, um, mm -hmm. but most are, and many young people spend an enormous amount of their time in school. Do you mm -hmm. think there is enough support in terms of counselling support around mental health in school? Lily, you might want to come in on this too. I see you shaking your head. <laughs> <laughs> Lily, do you, do you want to come in on this first and then we'll see what others have to say? Yeah, I can mostly speak for my own experiences and out of my friends. But with schools, they've recently started putting you know, psychologists in to kind of, you know, try and, you know, support students suffering with mental health, you know, a scale of um, severity. But it's one person, like Jess said, and the accessibility is, you know, minuscule. So we have, you know, small systems and, you know, people there, but they're not supported. Um, the amount of students who need people to talk to, who need, you know, trained professionals is overwhelming. And I think they don't get what they need in schools. And, you know, there is even less time in a school year than a normal year. So it's very hard <laughs> to be a student struggling with um, mental health or even just a student struggling in life. Um, I think that they're not equipped enough and there's only so much that you know schools now can do without you know help i think mm. Mm -hmm. mm. jess did you want to add to that um yeah um so i think one of the main issues that i have with um, relying or depending on school psychiatrists and counsellors and whilst I think that it's incredible that they are provided and um, they individually are doing incredible work I think the demand is just far too high for what um, they are able to provide so uh, like students can be waiting up to three or four months for a one-hour session or less than if um, it also depends on how busy the student is seeing as though they can only be during certain hours in the week so sometimes it may be a recess or it may be a lunch or a free period but the demand for those short sessions is like there are massive time spans in between and especially if a student is going through um, schooling which can be very very stressful um, they may not need the help as much as they did a week ago a day ago a month ago two months ago the support isn't there when they need it the most which can make things even worse and I think um, being school psychiatrists and counsellors it is also very much school focused and school based. So I find that the focus is much more on how we can manage our time or get our assignments in rather than what's going on with us individually. Because sometimes we may just need a chat. Sometimes there might be something else going on in family or no matter what it is, sometimes they, young people just need more than what is being offered. Um, and I actually think that's so important what Jazz said, especially at the end, you draw out what are the causes of this deterioration in mental health and you can connect it to all of the issues that we've mentioned before. Many people are concerned about the environment, um, gender identity, you talk about disability and they're all evidently in this whole concept of mental health. And when you address it all in a school environment, you sometimes forget that there are other elements in play that are also equally important to address. I think that's such an important issue because I think so often it's assumed across society that because children and young people spend so much time in school, that all issues can be resolved in and through school and all issues are somehow connected to school. And yet everyone's life is so much greater than one institution mm -hmm. within their lives. So I think mm -hmm. that's such a, a powerful message, you know, to think much more broadly and holistically about um, not just young people, but everyone's lives mm -hmm. and, and where supports are available and how those supports can be timely. 
one of the things that, that I guess we, or probably two issues that we hear such a great deal about are two issues that, that each of you have raised, and that's the environment and mental health. And of course, there are so many factors, as you just pointed out, Tommy, that, you know, that play into um, mental ill health. But how, much, how important do you think concern about the climate change emergency is for young people's mental health? You know, how, how much of a connection do you see there? Um, I've heard um, some people, um, when they're talking about the future, they're just like, will I have children? No, nah, I won't, because like, you don't want to raise them in a world where the environment is like in doom. Um, you have many people concerned about um, what do they do with their waste? Um, and then during the bushfire season we had earlier this year, how am I supposed to go out and do my shopping when I can't even breathe the air? You mm -hmm. see that all of these factors pile on and it's not just from, uh, you, you look and you see the many branches of climate change. You see, oh, it could be in the air that you breathe. It could be that the water that you wash your hands with has been contaminated. You look at the, um, the state of your, your backyard. It might not be green. It might be completely blackened because of the fires. And you see that many of these things interplay with each other that all come down onto your mental health and lead to perhaps its deterioration. Um, and I think one link that people often forget about in these discussions is the role that natural environments play in people's well-being as well. Mm -hmm. um, so there have been multiple studies done about how um, exposure to natural environments often can help um, lower blood pressure, increase happiness levels or what people gauge with their own happiness and identify. And that sort of side of well-being um, I think is incredibly important and it's one of the reasons why we should protect and make more of an effort to protect our green spaces in Canberra especially being known as the bush capital um, and like Tommy was saying environment just plays in so many different aspects of our lives and once it's gone it's gone and there's nothing we can do after that so it's very, very important to um, protect it and use it while we can and enjoy it while we can. I just want to add that a lot of, I, I know of myself included, that we kind of feel like we need to take on the burden of um, doing as much as we personally can to, you know, combat climate change and that stress, especially for, you know, um, individuals who can't in terms of um, the access they have, the, the money, the socioeconomic, you know, um, status that they have, how, like how can they, you know, help if they can't, then they feel, you know, burdened or guilty when on a much, it's, climate change must, like, has to be tackled, I suppose, on a much larger scale on, you know, a uh, renewable scale that can only be probably instituted, like, um, created run the government. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think that's such a powerful message that at some level, this takes leadership from politicians, from business leaders and across society to make the kinds of significant changes that we need. So I think you're right, Lily, we could all have um, a role that we can play, but there's only so much any of us can do individually. Mm -hmm. Sophie, did you want to add anything on this? I know you raised the environment earlier as one of those critical issues. Um, I think just as you guys were kind of saying, the environment is such an important thing to us all individually. But, and that's something that even though we all can do something individually, we need the help of like a larger like community or larger like help with like the government. And I think that's why like raising like awareness and listening to people um, concerns of the environment is so important and because like the environment is like a really big thing that is like sometimes too big for us so I think it's really important we mm. like get together and um, unite like the whole community and to raise awareness of how important it is. We're almost at the end of, of an hour and the hour has just flown 
There's one question that I wanted to ask of each of you before we close. And of course, this webinar and the series that this webinar sits within um, has been to mark 30 years since Australia ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child. That's a convention that applies to all people under the age of 18 um, and guaranteed a range of rights, including some of the things that we've been talking about today, you know, access to um, vital services, access to healthcare, and importantly, being able to express your views on things that matter and having those views taken seriously. And I'm wondering if we were to hold another webinar like this to mark the 40th anniversary of the convention, sort of 10 years on from today, what do you hope has changed in the ACT and in Australia? And are there things that you would like to stay the same that you think are working pretty well? Perhaps we can just go around the group and, and I can ask each of you what your thoughts might be on that. Um, Lily, would you like to, to lead off? Yeah, um, I'd like to say one of the things I think is really good about, you know, um, the ACT in our country is the amount of cultures and ethnicities we have. I think the multiculturalism in Australia is something we should all be proud of. And I do a lot of politicians, you know, claim, you know, multiculturalism with, you know, pride. However, oh, that's a bit ironic considering, you know, the way that people of different cultures are, you know, treated in Australia with microaggressions present in, you know, day-to-day -day life. So I'd say things that could change is, you know, equity and, you know, getting, like, uh, probably a bit ambitious to say, you know, remove all, you know, evidence of um, discrimination from our society. But that would be 40 or so years. Um, you know, not just, you know, discrimination on a racial and ethnic basis, but um, with the LGBT community or LGBTQA plus community, sorry, and um, reducing the, you know, wealth gap, you know, like getting rid of homeless poverty and allowing that everyone has access to mental health facilities, health facilities, you know, women all over their bodies and, you know, removing microaggressions, not just in, you know, the racial space, but as well as, you know, gender space against, you know, women and trans people and non-binary people. That would be, that'd be amazing. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, it sure would. Sophie, are there things that, that you would like to see change in the next decade or, or maybe stay the same? Um, I think just, I know I've mentioned this a lot, but definitely like environmental issues, putting more pressures on solving environmental issues is such a like thing that we need right now. So I think that's something I would like to see change, but also something to keep it uh, the same. I think the sense of community that we have in the ACT is such like a unique one, I feel, because like Canberra is a city that isn't too big, but it also isn't too small, which gives way to a perfect community. And I think that's so important to keep the same. Mm. Yeah, that is something very valuable about this place that we live in. Mm -hmm. Tommy, what, what for you do you want to see well, transformed those days? <laughs> Um, I was looking at the UNCRC and in particular, they highlighted four articles considered as special known as the general principles. Um, they highlight like areas of importance and improvement. Um, and the three ones that they did, the four, th three of the four included non-discrimination, right to life, survival and development and best interests of the child. However, the fourth article in particular for me is one that touches quite closely, which is the right to be heard. And as we've discussed, um, and it, like we've already talked about it, but in the next decade, I would love to see a paradigm shift in not only culturally, but governmentally, the treatment of the voices of youth and how we are able to express our opinions ourselves. So not only from an adult down to a child level, but a child to an mm -hmm. adult level and getting both parties to not only appreciate each other's voices, but um, being able to understand them better as well. Yeah. Um, an aspect that I might say I would like to see the same is the commitment to um, a commitment to be adaptable and to change, which has permeated into events like this webinar. Um, problems in society are 
ever changing, you know, with people growing up, society shifting, the occurrence of unprecedented events like the COVID pandemic. And this dynamic nature highlights the importance of a convention like the UNCRC and the voices of young people themselves in fighting for the rights and justice of young people. So it's this area of commitment to adaptability that I would love to see the same throughout the future. Yeah. It's great. And there have been some conversations, um, you know, over the last month, particularly in Australia, around the CRC. And some people have pointed out that the convention doesn't talk about the environment or climate change or some of the issues that are so critical 30 years on from when it was adopted by the UN General Assembly. But Tommy, as I'm listening to you talk about the best interests principle, the right to life, survival and development and, and to full development, um, and to listening to the voices and the views of children and young people, if we actually abide by those principles, then environment and climate change will be front and centre. But the at, the, at the same time, articulated. They're, they're perhaps implicit in yeah. those four areas, but they're not explicit in mentioning yeah. it, which I think that a lot of the voices of youth today are saying that it needs to be made more clear in yeah. stepping it through. Yeah. Absolutely. Jess, what are your um, Yeah, so I firstly wanted to start off by saying that I wholeheartedly agree with what everybody else has um, just said. And I think for mine, it's sort of interconnected. So I think um, what I love about Canberra is its community and its connecti connectiveness and how we interact as a whole. and. I think we have really incredible opportunities here in Canberra and I feel very fortunate to be a part of it. And what I hope stays the same, um, sorry, changes into the future is that I hope that we do continue to progress and that this community grows and we become ever more connected. And just like Tommy was saying, I hope that um, we, as a community begin to value the youth of young people for what it is and um, really just value everyone as a whole. And I think just continue to become closer um, as a nation and as um, the ACT community in itself. Jez, Tommy, Lily and Sophie, I think they're incredibly powerful messages for us to end on. Um, and incredibly powerful messages for us to take away from this 30th anniversary of the convention. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today and for sharing your views with us. Um, and please continue to share your views because we need your voices if we are going to address some of the problems that um, our world faces. So thank you so much. I also wanted to say thank you to everyone who's joined us throughout this series which I think has highlighted some of the really important achievements. And we've heard about some of those today, but also some very worrying, and in some cases, some shameful gaps and areas of neglect and violations of children's rights. If you've missed any of the webinars, you can find them on our website. If you just search Children's Policy Centre ANU, you will find those webinars. We still have so much work to do to ensure that the human rights of all children and young people are fully protected. And from us here at the Children's Policy Centre, we look forward to working with all of those who've participated in and connected with this webinar series to make those rights real. And we particularly look forward, I hope, to continuing to engage with you, Jazz, Tommy, Lily and Sophie, and to watching the incredible things that you do to make the human rights of children and young people real. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.